everyone. Welcome to the UUCH worship service. I am Reverend Patty Hanneman. I'm the minister of this congregation and I'm glad you're all joining us this morning. We've got several people that are going to be helping with the service this morning as well. Linda Hall will bless us with a reading and we have uh, lots of members that are going to be helping us with music today. I want to make sure that I mention all of their names. Avina Enoch is on the piano for most of our music. Allison Ralph sang the solo you just heard. Um, we're going to be ha having David Yelton singing our opening hymn. Aviva and Heather Kraft will be singing the meditation hymn. And for our closing hymn, we have several voices, including Ron Belcher, Jasper Becker, Grant Libermento, David Yelton, A.J. Mayhew, Heather Kraft, Lori Etter and her daughter Caroline, Alicia Volkheimer and her daughters Cadence and Tessa, Claire and Alan Julik, and Aviva. Alan's also going to be adding the bass and keyboard track for this song. So we thank you all this morning for offering such a rich musical experience for our worship. We also remember um, Steve and Allison Mahaley who are helping us with this video this morning. We're going to be sharing our plate with the Orange County, excuse me, Orange Congregations in Mission this month. If you have not yet made your monthly donation um, through our website, I encourage you to do that after the service this morning. And this morning we're going to continue our reflections on threshold moments as we think about how we might begin transitioning back into having face-to-face -face gatherings at UUCH. So we're very glad that you've joined us for this message this morning. Now I ask that we prepare ourselves for worship with some deep breaths together and we will center ourselves as we do that with these words by the Reverend Rod Richards as we light our chalice, gathering in sacred space. We who gather here in this tender and anxious and confusing time, we have been awash in a sea of information and misinformation and disinformation and this information that we seek is simply so that we may be wise in making decisions about how we respond and learn how we hold one another when we can't hold one another and decide how we can be 
when we can't be together? And what can we do for those who are most at risk, most vulnerable, all the time and especially now? And stick together and worship together when we can't be together, yet here we are, here, together. Our opening hymn this morning is Gather the Spirit, and David Yelton will sing that for us this morning. Gather the Spirit, harvest the power, our separate fires will kindle one flame. Witness the mystery of this hour, our trials in this light appear all the same. Gather in peace, gather in thanks gather in sympathy now and then gather in hope compassion and strength gather to celebrate once again gather the spirit of heart and mind seeds for the sowing are laid in store nurtured in love and conscience refined with body and spirit united once more gather in peace gather in thanks gather in sympathy now and then gather in hope compassion and strength gather to celebrate once again gather the spirit growing in all drawn by the moon and fed by the sun winter to spring and summer to fall the chorus of life resounding as one gather in peace gather in thanks gather in sympathy now and then gather in hope compassion and strength gather to celebrate once again greetings this reading is shelter in place by reverend gretchen haley there is enough space between us to hold all that you are carrying all you've been waking, wondering, worrying, or wearing out with confusion or attempts to control, trying to find some sense of normal, all of your irritability, your curiosity, your fragile sobriety, your numb disbelief, your loneliness, your exhaustion, your daily question, allergies or the virus and your joy. We can hold that too. We can hold all of it here for this time. And bless it, here we will call each other just as we are, beloved. Here in this far apart space that is also close in, so much remains uncertain with each passing breath, the ground is shifting. All we can say for sure is that we are caught in this tangled blessing of life, of grief and gratitude together. Like always, except more. With all the forces of spring and the spinning of the earth 
we are turning and becoming and beginning again, offering ourselves like the crocus flower, breaking through with a wild beauty, ready for whatever comes next. week we take a few moments to share our joys, sorrows, and milestones with one another. So our sharing with our joys um, helps us celebrate together. Our sorrows can be lessened as we share and our milestones acknowledged. I haven't had anyone um, contact me this week with any joys, sorrows, or milestones, and I want to remind all of you that um, as always, if you have anything that you would like for me to mention during this time, please email me by Wednesday evening and I'll make sure that we add it to our joys and sorrows list. And now if you have anything that you would like to share through our chat line, I invite you to do that now as we drop a stone for you in, recogni in recognition of what you've shared with us. In many ways, this time ha of isolation has felt almost uh, monastic to me. I've been able to develop a routine of working about six hours a day from home, and I've committed myself to um, a regimen of self-care that has felt really rejuvenating. And I know that I can only feel this way because I have a place of privilege in this pandemic. I'm not ill. I have no loved ones that are ill. Um, I have a, a partner who loves to shop, and so she's been doing all the shopping for us both. Um, I've not, neither one of us has had a change in our income. We've not had to do without anything, really. We've had enough shelter, food, um, health care. Uh, we've got a lot of outdoor space to enjoy this wonderful weather technology that helps me stay connected to people that I love. So um, I have not, I've not been suffering a lot from this pandemic. Also, and I just need to go on record and say I'm by nature an introvert. So um, I 
enjoy spending time alone and that's helped a lot. And yet I know that there are millions of people out there, working people and small business owners especially, that cannot earn money while sheltering at home and are facing a lot of um, economic problems, if not economic ruin. So I know that this pandemic has taken a toll um, in so many ways, um, and I want to be appreciative of, of that. My extended family, in some ways, uh, is a microcosm of uh, some of these stresses that the pandemic has caused. My 94-year-old mother uh, is very isolated. She lives alone. Most of her friends live in retirement communities, and they can't visit her anymore, and she's not able to visit them. Um, my son supervises uh, the crew that maintains the light rail system in Chicago, and many of his employees have come down sick. Some of them have been in ICU on ventilators. One of them has died. And uh, so he's been affected by this through his work. My, uh, his partner is unemployed. My daughter is at home, um, homeschooling five children and has just learned that there aren't going to be any summer camps this summer. So I am aware of the stresses that this pandemic has caused for a lot of families. North Carolina is a state that is seeking to ease some of these painful um, byproducts of the pandemic by recommending that we begin to come out of lockdown. Some faith communities that I've been in touch with are beginning to feel the pressure of also beginning to relax some of the guidelines that they've had. And I understand all the reasons for these recommendations, these state recommendations. But I also understand that America is still experiencing about 25,000 new confirmed cases of COVID-19 each day and that the vast majority of these cases are among healthcare workers, first responders, emergency personnel, essential workers that are not able to shelter at home, and the family members that live with them. As somebody who lives with an intensive care nurse, um, I am at greater risk for becoming infected, and not only for becoming infected, but also passing it on to someone else while I'm still asymptomatic. So these are some of the realities um, that are in my mind as um, I begin to consider as a faith community when and how we might begin to gather again. As Unitarian Universalists, we are fortunate in many ways uh, most importantly, we are a faith tradition that values scientific knowledge. It's, in fact, considered one of the sources of our wisdom from, uh, our, uh, for our living tradition. And I want to read to you from our hymnal the quote that uh, talks about this wisdom tradition which says that um, humanist teachings which counsel us to heed the guidance of reason and the results of science and warn us against idolatries of the mind and spirit are one of the things that we heed as a wisdom tradition. And so we don't need to heed the politics, the ideology, or the public opinion um, that is out there to make decisions about when we reopen. We don't even need to reopen um, because our denomination tells us to, because our congregations can each make their own decisions about what best practices are and what scientific information is out there for our area to help us make those decisions. But I've started imagining what opening our doors again might look like for UUCH. I've been researching changes other faith communities are considering. I've been looking at recommendations from the Unitarian Universalist Association and the North Carolina Council of Churches. I've had some Zoom calls with colleagues and have read the warnings from 
various healthcare professionals. A paper recently posted in the New York Times called The Risks, Know How to Avoid Them by Dr. Aaron Bromwich has seemed to capture the attention of many um, congregational leaders as they have struggled with this question of how to reopen. Bromwich cautions that the kinds of habits and rituals congregations promote can be especially risky for spreading the virus. His research shows that it is the length of time we spend in an enclosed space with an infected person times the number of viral particles the person expels per minute that determines the rates of infection. So let's think about how that might play out um, in our congregational life. We need to remember that sitting in the sanctuary with a group of people for up to an hour is going to be risky behavior. We need to remember that um, singing together, which um, both expels more viral particles and causes a person to breathe deeply so that the virus can lodge more deeply in the lungs, is risky behavior. The kind of speaking people do, like I'm doing right now, um, to project voices also poses a risk. So does laughing loudly, taking deep breaths together to center ourselves. These are all considered now to be risky behaviors. It's important that we use the scientific knowledge as we shape our time together moving forward. And at this moment, um, I am filled with many more questions than answers about what that looks like. But I do know that our gatherings are going to have to look very different from what they have looked like in the past. How will this information reshape us? Maybe we'll be using our outdoor spaces more. I remember last year when we were in our strategic planning process, um, Steve Mahaley and I talked to the youth group, and one of the things that they mentioned was that they thought we should use our outdoor spaces to more advantage, that we should look at ways to improve our space to make them um, more appealing to gather and more accessible. And so it might be time to rethink that and, and uh, consider how we might use outdoor spaces. Like maybe we'll start all of our worship services outdoors and sing all of our hymns in the open air um, before we come into the sanctuary for a shorter period of time. Or maybe we'll um, be using flat screen TVs um, or monitors to project the hymns so that we're all you know, projecting our voices up and away from the hymnals when we're singing together. Maybe we'll be using the library for um, some sort of isolation space and put monitors in there so that people who are most at risk can watch the service from that space. And maybe we'll be using the nursery um, for parents with children put a monitor in there so that they can be playing with their children while the service is happening instead of having um, child care providers. I don't know. You know, maybe we'll stop using the collection basket and passing it around. Maybe we'll be using masks and hand sanitizers. Maybe we'll be having people serving coffee with gloves instead of allowing people to um, self-serve. These are all questions that I have, um, possibilities, things that other congregations are considering. So I just want to bring this up as ways that we might think about gathering differently in the future. I'm hoping to gather together with the ministry council members fairly soon for a Zoom meeting so that we can begin having conversations about some of these changes um, or other changes, how each one might affect um, the team's ministry. And uh, we will also, I think, um, need to relook at our budget requests and see if they still make sense for this coming fiscal year. 
um, whether we need to reshape how we're going to be spending our money this year. So as we begin to consider how and when and where to gather as a community, I would ask us to keep a couple of things in mind. The first one is I don't think we will ever feel quite as safe gathering together as we did before. So I want to remind all of us of the poem by Mickey Scott Bay Jones that we have used for our in-gathering services before about what it looks like to create beloved space. Her poem begins with these words. Together we will create brave space because there is no such thing as safe space. We've been here before, my friends. We have asked you to allow us to use best practices and scientific knowledge to determine courses of action about gathering together, even though um, our emotions may tell us that it may not be as safe as we would like. Please know that we will do our best to determine what and when is safe enough knowing that our space will never be perfect. But it can be our brave space together. And we can work side by side to do this brave spacing because being together matters to us. And that brings me to the second thing I hope we can remember. That is that historians have long known that a crisis can be a turning point for a community. This crisis will become part of the history of this congregation. Will it lead us down a dark path to distrusting each other and fearing one another? Or will it lead us to consider what is most important to us? If we take the second approach, we could look together for alternative ways to be in community so that those things that are central to who we are remain intact. We should be thinking about what story we will want to tell years from now about how we responded to this pandemic. Human beings have not evolved to fight and compete as much as they have evolved to make friends and work together. Our connections here at UUCH are not just our valuable, our most valuable asset, they are our greatest strength. And I am sure that in the days ahead, we will find ways to build on that strength. May it be so and blessed be.
Extinguish our chalice today to these words by Amy Zucker Morgenstern. Never has it been more true than now. We extinguish this flame, but the sparks with, within us remain a light from each of us in our supposed solitude. The signals buzz and hum, sparkling through space one to another, connecting us invisibly but palpably we are one and from every single window our lights continue to shine go in peace my friends and blessed be to my loved ones and relations with me in spirit every day to neighbors I have not yet met close to home and far away. Be safe, be well, you mean the world to me. Be safe, be well, you mean the world to me. To my friends who make their music, share and joy both far and wide. To those who we depend on to teach, to heal, and guide. Be safe, be well, you mean the world to me. Be safe, be well, you mean the world to me. And to all who hear this message, to strangers and to friends, Here's an embrace of music until we meet again. Be safe, be well, you mean the world to me. Be safe, be well, you mean the world to me. Yes, be safe, wash your hands, you mean the world to me. Be safe, stay home.